From Earth's brightest builders to our bravest explorers. Every accomplishment, every accolade, every bit of this round of applause started with a love of trying things. And algorithms. But now, it's your turn. What will you try? Oh my gosh, what were you doing when you were a teenager? I wasn't doing that, but the Google Science Fair is looking for ideas that are going to change the world. And today, we are chatting with two Ontario students who beat out thousands of competitors. You are two of the top 20 finalists in the Google Science Fair, so welcome. We've got Isabella O'Brien, 13 years old, and Calvin Reader, 18 years old. This uh, science fair is pretty amazing because you beat out tons of people from around the world with your ideas. So let's start with you, Isabella. You're only 13, but you came up with something pretty incredible. What is it? Uh, so for my project, I was researching ocean acidification. And so what ocean acidification is, is when human produced carbon dioxide is mm -hmm. absorbed by the ocean, it changes the ocean chemistry. And it makes it a lot harder for things like mussels, clams, and oysters to build their shells because the pH levels are lowering. So you were on vacation in yeah. Mexico. Mm -hmm. You saw a bunch of dead coral, right? Yes. And that's what inspired you to, to make a change. Yes. So what I thought was that because there's a lot of dead coral and it was kind of sad, so mm -hmm. I was looking into what has a lot of calcium carbonate, which is what our oceans are missing, that I could possibly put back into the oceans. And one of the things that I found that has a lot of calcium carbonate is actually shells and things like mussels and clams and oysters. Mm -hmm. And when I looked into it, there's actually about six million metric tons of shells that go into the landfills every single year. So I thought, what if I recycled these shells back into the ocean where they're supposed to be and see if that will raise the ocean's pH levels uh -huh. uh, temporarily so that we have more time to try to reduce our CO2 emissions. That is pretty incredible for you to come to that conclusion as well. You must have had tons of mentors being only 13 years old. How do you get from where you, you know, I guess, way back to love science and where you are now to think of doing this? Well, I had a really good grade one, two, three science teacher, and oh. he just made it so fun. And at our school, once you hit grade four, it's optional to do science fair. And I knew since grade one, I was going to do it in grade four. And it was a lot more work than I thought, <laughs> but it was really fun. You've got to give him a shout out. What's his name? Uh, Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon, you could help Isabella change the world. Pretty amazing. <laughs> and I just found out, Calvin, you went to my high school, St. Thomas Aquinas in Oakville. So shout out to everyone there. You must have had some cool science teachers growing up as well. Oh, oh de definitely. And um, I started doing science fair in my elementary school in grades seven and eight, and mm -hmm. we had the teacher there was just so so dedicated and yeah. a, and into encouraging it and helping helping everyone along. Let's talk about your thing because when I was reading about your experiment, I thought Survivor Man. You know, if you're kind of in the middle of the woods, and how are you going to survive and find that water? But of course, it has greater use. What did you come up with? So in my project, I designed a system that can condense water from the air at night and from contaminated surface water. And so, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. I'm intrigued. Go on, Calvin. Yeah. So I was inspired by the global water crisis and how there's bi uh, one billion people in the world who lack cl clean drinking water. And so, and just from observing water condensing on sur surfaces at night and grass, I thought, yeah. could this be used on a larger scale to produce drinking water? Right. And so, and further, I thought that a lot of people have access to contaminated water. Mm -hmm. And so, if the device could collect it from the air at night and from contaminated surface water passively without using electricity, it could really help a lot of people suffering from water shortages. Absolutely. What you're, what's uh, right next to you there, it's kind of hard to demonstrate on it, so we, right. we won't do it, but just what are we looking at? So here's my pr uh, prototype in uh -huh. the, fr in the um, uh, atmospheric water condenser arrangement, okay. so the, for collecting water from the air at night. And so it it's made of aluminum and it contains long vertical cells in, in, in which water condenses and flows to where it can be collected. Now, and so... I'm amazed by this. I, sorry, I think a lot of people are... Kevin Frankish is in the corner going like this, tell me more, very interesting, <laughs> yeah. And so well, water will condense on it and flow to the base where it can be collected. Mm -hmm. Now, if it just relied on the natural process of condensation, it wouldn't, water wouldn't, as, as you can see, dew doesn't happen every night. And no. so, um, in order to increase the amount of water I could condense and the amount, of, the amount of nights in which condensation occurs, I designed passive cooling techniques. So You need a contraption like this. I wish we could go on more, but uh, we've got to tell you what's going to be happening. September, you guys will be traveling to California to meet your fellow competitors. 
uh, and there are people from all over the world. We wish you the best of luck, and you'll be demonstrating there. Will you come back if you win? Definitely. <laughs> if you co-win, because I think that could happen. On breakfasttelevision.ca, if you want to learn more about these two incredible people, you guys are going to go so far. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We're going over to you, Jen. Awesome. Thank you.